Well, hey, everybody, this is Robert, and welcome to today's podcast. Now, last month, New Hampshire health officials released an alert after identifying two locally acquired echinococcus granulosis cases, the first such cases of this parasitic infection locally acquired in the state. So joining me today to discuss the parasite and the situation in New Hampshire is Elizabeth Talbot, MD. Dr. Talbot is the New Hampshire Deputy State Epidemiologist. She's a professor at Dartmouth College, and she's an infectious disease specialist. Dr. Talbot, welcome to the show, ma'am. Thank you so much for having me. You bet. Uh, very interesting cases, and I'm, I'm really anxious to hear more about it. But before we get into the actual cases, um, I'd like to go ahead and give the audience the ABCs of a kinococcus, because it's not a everyday word in uh, mm -hmm. in this country. So, um, Dr. Talbot, what is the parasite and how common is it in the U.S.? Echinococcus is a dog tapeworm. So it's a parasite that um, uh, preferentially completes its life cycle in a canid or a dog or a dog-like animal. Um, it is not common in the United States, but is in worldwide distribution. So it's well known globally, is particularly common in places uh, where sheep raising occurs because sheep and other hoofed animals serve an important role in the, in the parasite's life cycle. So, um, uh, so a zoonotic infection. That's right. Um, so how do people typically contract this disease, this tapeworm? Um, I think this will be the first time of multiple that I say this. It's extremely rare in humans. Yeah. So this is a parasite that wants to be in a zoonotic life cycle, as you've said. It, it wants to circulate between a canid, a dog-like animal, and an ungulate, a hoofed animal. Occasionally, humans get involved in that inadvertently um, by consuming eggs uh, that are in the feces of the canid. So... Um, the pathology, uh, mm -hmm. not a common thing seen in the U.S., as you said, um, but what is the typical pathology, the clinical presentation of cystic echinococcus um, in people? When you or I inadvertently consume an egg of this parasite, it, it enters our body and typically lodges in the lung or in the liver. It's been seen in lots of different sites, um, but, but those are the preferred spots where this uh, parasite larva lands. So in the liver or the lung, it grows very slowly, um, actually over years. So one of the few infections that, that can last in a human, 10, 15, even longer, even more, more years than that. And um, the symptoms of it are referable to um, how big this lesion gets and, and where it's located. What's it pressing on? Um, and, and does it actually spontaneously rupture, which, which can cause um, allergic reaction? So, um, as, as far as the pathology, I mean, can this become a fatal infection in humans? I, I'm afraid so. Uh, yeah. So, for example, if it does become very large, it, it can impede um, normal function of those organs where lodged, you know, in, in the liver or the lung, it can reduce normal function. Um, and then the rare outcome of the lesion rupturing, either spontaneously because of pressure or um, even as a result of having surgery on it, um, that can release bits of this parasite in such a way that anaphylaxis ensues, and that can be a fatal condition. Sure. Um uh, and uh, I, I understand you're not a veterinarian, but I was wondering if you had the ability to, um, what, what, would, what would you see in your dog if they were infected? Mm. Um, you're, you're right, not a veterinarian, but, <laughs> but I have read a fair bit about it for the okay. implication it has for dog owners. Um, and, and what I understand is that it's um, typically remarkably asymptomatic. Oh, okay. so, so this is an infection where, where the adult tapeworm gets into the intestine of the dog 
and then does what it does, produces eggs, um, hundreds of eggs, thousands of eggs over its lifetime. And the dog is um, usually unaware, unaffected. Okay, well, not good for the uh, owner because mm -hmm. nothing to see. Um, so I take the dog is the definitive host of this parasite. Um, Dr. Talbot, let's go ahead and switch gears now to the cases in your state. Mm. Um, can you discuss these two similar but unrelated cases? Sure. What what um, we put into the public space um, uh, that, that we wanted to share so that clinicians would have this on their radar predominantly is that we've um, now confirmed two cases in um, persons in New Hampshire, and in particular from extreme northern New Hampshire. So um, they, they presented quite classically with um, imaging showing the, the cyst, the lesion, the, the place where the larva um, has, has gotten a foothold. Um, and, and each was having um, uh, a workup for that. You know, the imaging that's uh, sometimes incidentally done for another purpose and shows the lesion or because of symptoms is often pretty classic. There's not many things that create the appearance of these kinds of lesions. Um, so the radiologist who saw this immediately triggered the alert, this looks like an echinococcus lesion, and then the, the workup ensued. And, 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 and these, were, these cases were months apart, mm -hmm. am I correct? Right. Yeah. Yes, you are. Yeah, and um, the other common thread was they were hunters. Uh, is, that, is that correct? So, so the, 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 you're correct that um, these are unrelated persons uh, and, and they were identified months apart. But as said, this is often a very slow growing infection. And so it's, it's unclear whether they had these for months or even years or up to a decade before they came to identification. The common thread, the reason that um, they likely acquired disease um, is that they um, participated in the slaughter, the prep of hunted moose and had their dogs present and able to consume the offal, the, the leftover meats, right. the organ meats of that infected cerva, the infected moose. So in the diagnosis was they, they came down with some kind of symptoms and it was imaging and there's not, there's not like a satisfactory laboratory test that you could send out, right? It, basically it's, it's basically imaging and. Imaging is the, the best. And that's yeah. the most common way that thing that this infection is identified. There is a blood test um, and it's fraught with false positive and false negative sure. results. So yeah, indeed, as a clinician, we depend on our radiologists to interpret the specific imaging with this expertise, yeah. Yeah. And um, is there a successful treatment regimen for echinococcus? I mean, because you have this cyst, I mean, it, does it have to be surgically removed or is it can be taken care of with drugs or how, how does that work? There, there are generally three approaches to, mm -hmm. to treatment. You've mentioned one, which is surgical removal. Mm -hmm. this, this may be necessary depending on how big and where it is. Uh, on the flip side, it may be impossible if it's in a vulnerable place, you know, too mm -hmm. close to vital organs or so. Um, the, the second approach is to treat with medication alone. There is really one standard medication that's an oral pill called albendazole, mm -hmm. and it's taken for months. Um, it's a tragedy to me that albendazole is pennies and widely available on the global market. And yet in the United States, um, this drug can be tens of thousands of dollars um, in, a, in a really inequitable um, distribution of this drug. Um, the third way is a very unusual um, approach to treatment of infection. And it's uh, got an abbreviation called PAIR, P-A-I-R, puncture, aspiration, installation of a chemical that kills this parasite and then re-aspiration. So um, this technique uses a needle and ultrasound generally to find the lesion uh, and, and um, puncture it, inject a chemical that kills it, and then um, suck it out, basically. Mm -hmm. so, Are they all equally successful type treatments? What I'm learning about it, again, since it's a pretty rare disease in our setting, 
sure. uh, is that uh, it has to be individualized to the patient's condition. Sure. So one single small lesion may be treated by the pill alone. Multiple large lesions are not amenable to surgery, but probably a combination of pair and the, the pill you see. So it's it's got to be individualized for the patient. Okay. Um, and lastly, uh, Dr. Talbot, what is public health doing to protect the public and particularly the hunters uh, mm -hmm. from this tapeworm? Are there prevention methods being advised? And is, 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 is imagine it's education, I mean, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, <laughs> education is going to be paramount here, and yeah. it can come from in several different approaches. One is um, uh, the education for those who prepare meat like moose meat uh, in, in, in northern New Hampshire um, to not let their dog eat the offal that's a part of that process. Mm -hmm. um, second, the education comes from an appropriate relationship with your veterinarian who should, under almost all conditions, recommend deworming empiric deworming of your dog. So this is why we engage with our veterinarians. Sometimes we're not even sure of why we, we're paying for that deworming, but in fact, um, it takes care of the fact that this is a parasite in our environment, this and others like it. So it's important to take care of your dog. Uh, we'll all benefit from that. Um, we also wanna keep the viscera from hunting experiences away from other kinds of canids. Mm -hmm. So so dispose of those viscera according to what um, your fish and game department um, is advising. Um, we should always cook game meat thoroughly if we're gonna give it to our dogs. Um, so I think that there's a multi-pronged approach and these are highly effective methods to prevent human infections. Uh, and again, this is an extremely rare event um, but does show our close relationship to zoonotic infections in our um, planet. Sure. And, and let me just follow up with one, one more personal question. Okay. Um, being an infectious disease physician in New Hampshire, never seen a locally acquired case of this before. How surprised were you when these popped up? So um, no patient should want to be interesting <laughs> to a physician. Yeah, right, right. right? Um, so so I, I want to strike the right balance of I am sympathetic uh, for what these patients have gone through and are facing. Um, you know, any, any moment of ill health um, needs to be thought of beyond the um, academic interest of, yeah, sure. of, of the situation. But sure, I, I, this is a disease I've heard of my entire career. And I'm um, particularly aware of in global arenas. Uh, this is more commonly um, found in, in, in other settings. And so finding it here in New Hampshire, I think, um, is, is actually a contribution to the overall health of our population. I was surprised and I've been gratified by um, the participation of New Hampshire Fish and Game, our, our state veterinarian, the health department, and the clinicians who have been involved in the cases. Yeah, I, I have noticed in recent years, we. Um, some parts of Alberta and those parts of Canada have seen an increase in it too. Mm -hmm. In uh, kind of caucus, I think it's the other the other strain though. Um, not you're exactly right, multilocularis. Yeah, yeah. Um, And this has been seen in um, Alaska as well in the yeah. United States, um, but is is well known in Canada. Um, of coincidence, uh, Vermont, our neighbor, um, yeah. has just reported two human cases of. Um, that multilocularis version of a kinococcus, um, and it appears to be a European strain, uh, which more commonly circulates between small mammals like voles, mice, mm -hmm. and foxes. So um, it's it's really a, a massive coincidence that that we have um, these two events in these neighboring states. Yeah, that's some amazing stuff. Yeah. Um, well, thank you, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Talbot, for sharing your time and expertise. I really appreciate it. Well, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. You're welcome. All right.